Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here and welcome back to the railway. Today I'm going to attempt to prove something that many of us think we know and some people quite reasonably, I think, have questioned. And the question is this, is there an advantage to having separate bearings on the driving wheels of our model trains? <laughs> Just to define my terminology, when I say bearings, I actually mean these bushings. They are bushings that are fitted to the driving axles of locomotives, and they're usually turned out of a metal such as brass, bronze, or something else. But since these bushings bear the weight of a locomotive on the axle, I'm going to stick with the word bearing just for simplicity's sake. Some locomotives have these bearings fitted to their driving axles, and other locomotives don't. Over the course of my channel, I've reviewed and tested over 400 locomotives, and in that experience, I would say that most of the best running locos I've come across did have the bearings fitted. So because of those experiences of mine, I've always been convinced that these bearings are worth having. But today, I'm going to put that theory to a test with an experiment, and here is the experiment. So, I've got two loco chassis. Now, both of these are A1 locomotives, which mean they are of a similar size, they have the same size driving wheels, they have the same valve gear, etc, etc. This is a Hornby one, it weighs 320 grams, and it does have bearings fitted to its axles, as you can see. I've disconnected the gears, I've removed the front bogey and the pony wheels because those are not driving wheels, we'll take those out of the equation. I've removed the base keeper plate because I don't want any extra drag from the pickups. And this means that the chassis is completely free rolling on its bearings with any other source of friction kept to an absolute minimum. The second chassis is a Backman chassis. It's still an A1 locomotive chassis, but it is quite a lot lighter than the Hornby one. So I've added some weights to this to bring it up to exactly 320 grams, which is the same as the Hornby A1 chassis. This chassis does not have bearings. Instead, the axles ride directly onto the metal chassis. Just as with the Hornby one, I've removed the gears, removed any extra wheels and also the pickups on the base keeper plate so that this chassis is also completely free to roll. So here is how the experiment is going to go. Both chassis are going to be placed at the end of a long straight piece of track and a piece of string will be connected to the front of each chassis. This piece of string runs along the length of the track over the edge of the table where a bag is tied to the end. By gradually adding very small amounts of weight to this bag, I should be able to accurately determine exactly how much force is required to overcome the friction in the bearings and accelerate the chassis until the bag hits the ground. If the separate bearings do make a positive difference to a loco, then less weight should be required to accelerate the chassis with the proper bearings. Now there are some limitations of this experiment and we're trying to do some proper science here, so let's talk about those. First of all, obviously there is going to be some extra drag caused by the string, which means this experiment won't accurately measure the exact force required to move each chassis, but it should be able to accurately measure the difference in the forces required to accelerate each chassis, and that's really what we're interested in. Yes, obviously I'm not running this experiment in a vacuum, so air resistance is going to be a factor, but the impact will be absolutely minuscule at this sort of speed. And because we're using A1 chassis in both cases, the difference in the surface area of each chassis shouldn't be that different. So again, this shouldn't really matter. Let's get to the experiment then. So the chassis without the bearings is up first. It's sat at the end of the track, as you can see. I'm starting off by adding one five gram weight, no movement there at all. So now I'm gradually adding one nut at a time and each nut weighs approximately one gram. Now that I've added one five gram weight and 11 one gram nuts, we can see the chassis take off and move along the track. So we can now take the contents of the bag, pop it on the scales and use the weight to calculate the force required to accelerate the chassis. Now for the sake of consistency, I'm repeating that experiment multiple times this allows me to calculate an average across multiple different results and it should also allow me to eliminate any anomalies I find. 
Now I'm moving on to do exactly the same thing but with the chassis with the proper bearings. So the Hornby A1 chassis is now on the end of the track. Remember the weight here is exactly the same as the Backman one we've just seen. The experiment is repeated exactly as before. So we're starting with the 5 gram weight and slowly adding one nut at a time to see what happens. This time only three nuts were required in addition to the 5 gram weight before the locomotive would run along the track. And I'm doing exactly the same thing, I'm repeating the experiment multiple times to get several different results. Again we're eliminating the anomalies and now I have a pretty conclusive result. So. The chassis without the proper bearings took an average of 16.16 grams to move it, which is a force of 0.16 newtons. Now, the chassis with the bearings took only 7.93 grams to move the loco, and therefore the average force required here was 0.078 newtons, which is only 49% of the force required to move the chassis without bearings. So, that's pretty clear, isn't it? But we need to try another example. Maybe the valve gear is different between the two locos, so let's do this experiment with a different pair of chassis. So this time I've picked out an 060 chassis which doesn't have any valve gear, so we can eliminate that. This is a Backman Collet class, which is an 060 chassis. It has no bearings on it, as you can see. I've stripped everything off the chassis as I did before, so it's got no gears connecting the motor, it's got no pickups. I have left some of the gears connected to the wheel set, and that's because the other chassis that I'm going to use with the bearings is the Hornby J36, and it's a bit of a pain to remove the gears from that. So this time both locos will still have gears connected to the driving wheels, but not to the motor. The J36 chassis is also totally stripped out to run just on the wheels slash bearings and I have added some extra weight here to match the Backman chassis weight of 136 grams. And as you can see both chassis weigh exactly the same. On to the experiment then, we're going to start with the chassis without the bearings again and I'm going to do this in exactly the same way as before, except this time I'm expecting less weight to be needed to move these chassis because they only weigh about half of what the A1 chassis did. So I'm not going to bother with the 5 gram weights this time, I'm just going to go straight for the nuts. So the chassis without bearings actually took 10 nuts before it moved off, that's 0.1 newtons, and of course I did the usual repeats of this experiment to get an average weight. The 060 chassis with the bearings took much less, you won't be surprised to hear. This one actually took 4 nuts on average, which was 3.17 grams or 0.037 newtons. That is 37% of the weight required to move the chassis without the bearings, that's less than half. So I've been doing these experiments for the last couple of days and the results are clear and they are also repeatable. Having bearings on a locomotive chassis creates a freer rolling chassis, which means the motors and the gears are having to work less hard, there's less strain on those components to produce the same result, that result being a good smooth running locomotive. Frankly though, we knew this already. We've been observing this for years. Locos with bearings are better than those without. You can see it in their performance. And after all, all manufacturers, or nearly all of them these days, do fit bearings on their locos. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't waste their time and money in designing that into the model and paying for the extra parts if it wasn't worthwhile. So, to make this video a little bit more interesting, I'm going to have a go at explaining why these separate bearings produce a better running chassis. So, to do this, I'm going to be drawing from my experience of testing and running all those different locos that I have over the years, and I'm also going to draw from my experiences of scratch building, designing chassis, etc, etc. I did a lot of experimentation when I was doing that, and I learnt a lot from it. At the same time though, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a professional scientist, these are just my theories. If you've got any other reasons in mind, if you've got any other theories as to why the bearings produce a better result than without bearings, please do comment down below, I'd be really interested in what you have to say. So, here is a 3D diagram of a chassis without bearings. The axle sits directly into this slot, the points of contact here are marked in red, as they are for all of my diagrams, 
and then a base keeper plate is screwed to the base to keep the axle in place. If there's no clearance between the axle and the base keeper plate, then the base keeper plate will touch the axle and cause resistance and the wheel set will be very, very stiff. And so you have to include a little bit of clearance that looks like this. Also, manufacturing tolerances mean that models don't always come out of the mould in exactly the same way, so you have to build this into the design as well. If the tolerances are too fine, then sometimes you'll get stiff wheel sets because parts are touching, and other times you won't. And in fact, we've seen an example of this with the Helgen 1361 class, whereby if you fully tightened the screws on the base keeper plate, the wheel set would lock up. So to avoid this, you put a bit of clearance in, as you can see. These designs work different across different locos, but it's the same principle for most of them. But now the loco is free to move around a little bit. It can oscillate a little bit, it can vibrate. And my theory is that this is where some of the losses occur. You've got energy being wasted on making these parts move around and vibrate rather than them staying still and all of the energy from the motor and the gears being translated into the forwards motion of the locomotive. With a bearing though, it's a little bit different. The bearings fit between the chassis and the base keeper plate, and when the bearing is manufactured via turning, the hole can precisely match the diameter of the axle, which produces a perfect fit. And then the bearing can be clamped between the chassis and the base keeper plate with a little bit of force and that will produce no resistance because it's the bearing in contact with the axle and not the chassis and the base keeper plate. This means that the axle can be held in a very specific spot without any of that movement, vibration, oscillation while still leaving the axle completely free to turn because the bearing fits the axle perfectly. Some of these bearings can even be oil filled, which means that they self lubricate, which further reduces friction. And I've used some of these oil filled bearings in some of my loco projects and they're great. You don't actually have to lubricate them. I have been doing, but you don't really have to. They're super smooth, really, really good. Clearly very little friction there. I also suspect that the act of turning a bushing rather than let's say casting a bearing as part of a larger chassis produces a smoother interior surface which reduces friction even more. But even a cast bearing which has a slightly rougher surface perhaps, even that will still have those advantages in the sense that it keeps the axle in a steady position which reduces the amount of movement it has and therefore the amount of vibration and oscillation. Okay, so what about a little aside? What about square bearings? So this is where not only does a chassis not have separate bearings, but it also has square slots for the axle rather than round ones. So because in this example, we still don't have the separate bearings, the idea of the oscillation and vibration still stands because you have to leave that clearance between the axle and the chassis and the base keeper plate, etc., etc. But with the square slot, we now have a tiny contact area between the axle and the chassis. Again, this is marked in red. There's a couple of contact areas on the left and right, but when the weight is on the loco, it's this one at the bottom that takes most of the weight. Compare this with the circular slot, and you can see that the contact area is much, much larger. In fact, if the slot was perfectly square and the axle was a perfect cylinder, the contact area would be infinitely small. Now, in reality, of course, these are not perfect shapes on a microscopic level, but they are close enough to mean that the contact area is absolutely tiny. This reduced contact area might mean that there's less friction in the system, but this comes at a cost. This has the effect of concentrating all of the force of the loco onto these tiny points, which produces wear in the chassis. And I've even observed this wear by taking close-up photos of my own engines. I've also observed that locos with this design seem to get dirtier faster. The axles are normally quite grubby when you open them up and you also have to keep them better lubricated, otherwise this wear just is accelerated. Of course, wear will occur in the axle too, but to a lesser degree as the wear is distributed around the circumference of the axle as the loco runs, rather than on a single point as it is on the chassis. 
Over time then, the axle gradually wears the chassis until the contact area increases to spread the force sufficiently so that the amount of wear slowly balances and levels out to close to zero. These renders are exaggerated slightly, I think it would take you a long, long time and no lubrication to get to this point. So it's not like these locos are going to wear out immediately and become useless, this does take a long time, I'm sure it would take a very long time to get this bad, but you can see the point. So now the axle has even more room to move around in its slot because it's worn a little bit extra space for itself. And raising a wheel up into the chassis like that could mean that the gears mesh closer together, that can cause issues, added friction, etc. And the increased contact area between the axle and the chassis means that the initial reduction in friction due to the small contact area is now lost anyway. We've just got more slop on the axle now. Now, in a bearing, materials like brass will almost certainly be much softer than the chassis material, but because they fit the axle so perfectly and the load is spread over a much larger surface area, orders of magnitude larger, in fact, because basically half of the axle will be in contact with the bearing at all times. Much, much more than just that single point. So that despite the softer bearing material, you just don't see the wear, particularly if those self-lubricating bearings have been used. And I see this in my own servicing as well. Even the very oldest locos in my collection still seem to show a perfect fit between the axle and the bearing. That's possibly because the bearings can get rotated randomly during servicing, which means that different parts of the bearing see the wear year on year, rather than just the same point as it would be on a chassis. And even if these bearings did wear out over time, it's much, much cheaper to replace the wheel set and the bearings than it is to replace the chassis. Take the Hornby A1 for example, a new wheel set which includes the bearings, £5.99 from Hornby.com. If you want a chassis, well, first of all, Hornby don't sell those, so you have to go to eBay, where they are over £40. I don't know about you, but in the unlikely event a loco does wear out, I'd rather spend a fiver than 40 quid. So yeah, the bearings for me are definitely the way to go. I've proven quite clearly that they have an advantage in locos. Locos do seem to run smoother and they require less force to move than when they don't have them. I think that is fairly clear. I've also given you my theories as to why I think this is. Do you agree? Do you have other ideas? Please do comment down below and let me know. If there's anything else you'd like me to investigate further, please do let me know. I've really enjoyed this. I certainly wouldn't mind doing it again. For now though, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something and I'll see you very, very soon for some more videos. All right, cheers folks. Take care.